And with that, we're going to get started right away. We have our first presenters all ready and raring to go. We're going to give them a chance to uh, give a presentation. We'll have some uh, responses and some questions from our panel of them. And then we'll open it up to the floor. So that's kind of got to be the format as we go through this morning. Of uh, Presenters will come in and there will be some questions from the panel and then questions from the floor. And we'll just keep repeating that. So off we go. Welcome. And uh, turn it over to Mark. Uh, we're Ryan and Jance Marquardt of Wilder Rose Pastures. Uh, we're located between uh, Hell and Newton, uh, just about 45 minutes east of the metro. Uh, we started our business in, in 2007. We were part of the Grow Your Small Market Farm class from Penny Brown Huber. Uh, we started that year with a pilot year. We raised uh, 100 chickens on pasture on a farm we rented between Boone and Story City, and then we, uh, we raised 30 turkeys. And then we started building our customer base. Uh, later that year, we ended up buying 40 acres with a livable house and outbuildings uh, at our current location. Uh, it was reasonably priced, so we were pretty pumped about that. Uh, we raise, uh, currently we're raising chickens, turkeys, lamb, beef, and eggs. We've added those products kind of slowly over time. And our trade area is Ames, Des Moines, and Pella. We do deliveries to those sites. And then our, we're supported by Janice's uh, off-farm income. Uh, during 2008 and 9, those were pretty good years for us. We uh, added additional product lines. Uh, that's when eggs came on, our lamb came on online, uh, and our customer base grew from what was about uh, 40 names, 35, 40 names our first year, over 100. Uh, and then we started having, so we had some troubles in 2010 and 2011, and they've been uh, <laughs> oh, kind of uh, difficult on us. We had uh, uh, some health issues with our turkeys in 2010 and a mass storm event. And so we, uh, we, we are only finished 50, like 60 of our 250 turkeys that year. We ended up having to broker 110 turkeys. That brokering was done on pretty favorable terms, so we came out okay from that process. Uh, 2011 was much worse, was much harder on us. And we, uh, we had, uh, had some health troubles with our brooders, and so we had some mass predator events hit us. Uh, some of our, our turkeys end up being small. Let's say our, our average bird is about eight pounds this year, and our typical average bird is about 12 to 13 pounds. Every pound of average off of where is about $1,000 in sales for us. So we were run, it was a little over $1,000 in sales for us. We were running about four to 5,000 uh, below what we were anticipating. So that's put us in kind of a uh, 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 soft spot moving into next year that we're trying to kind of just limp through right now. Uh, this year we did build a 20 by 39 divided poultry building to get ahead of some of the health issues we were having. So we have divided brooder and, uh, and layer facilities in that building. And so that I think that's the building is just about done now. So I'm really pumped about that moving into next year. We have a series of goals and objectives <laughs> every year. And so, uh, I mean, but some of them are more important than others. Finishing that poultry building is, is a top priority for this year. And then, uh, uh, getting back to building fences. We didn't build any fence last, <laughs> last year. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Uh, we didn't build any fence last year, so we'll be building, uh, getting back to building fence this year. We have, like I said, our farm is uh, 40 acres, and uh, let's just say that it hasn't had livestock on it in about uh, 30 years, and so we, the facilities are extremely dilapidated, and so we've been investing significantly in bringing those facilities up to par to make our lives easier. Looking out over the long term, we've got an old, old building that we have been using for poultry right now that we'll be, we'll be taking half of it off and then re-roofing that and then putting a driveway through. So we have a loop driveway. Right now we have a really unsafe situation where you, you back down your driveway and it's kind of a blind hill that you live on. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't want to die on the driveway. <laughs> 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 Getting hit by somebody flying over that hill. So uh, we'll try to get that corrected as soon as humanly possible. And then looking out, we're still eligible for the beginning farmer loan program out out into the future for several more years, and so uh, we'd like to use that possibility to uh, look at acquiring additional land and uh, growing our land base quite a bit. So most of our marketing is uh, through word of mouth, as is true with most farms, and uh, we also have a pretty good farm website. Um, <clears throat> I took a Dreamweaver class, and that uh, was very helpful. I'm kind of a technical-minded sort of person. So um, it has an order form on it that actually sends a direct email and doesn't bring up an email program. It just sends it. Uh, that was a bit of a challenge to get programmed, but it was worth every minute I spent on it because it is wonderful. Um, and then we got maps to the farm, which are always necessary when you live in the middle of nowhere. 
um, and pictures of our product and that sort of thing. So uh, a good website is, is so, so important. You cannot overstress it. Um, part of that was also that I did go and there are some things you can do with Google to make yourself a little more findable. Um, it takes a little more work to go and find those things you can do, but Google has these things set up where you can enter keywords and um, everything like that. And if you spend the time doing that, people are much better able to find you when they search for Pella local chicken. So I've had some people find me that way. Um, and otherwise, they may or may not. <laughs> So uh, we both maintain a blog presence. Um, Ryan's is exclusively farm. Mine is farm and then some quilting and hazel and just whatever I feel like blogging about. But I usually try to put something about the farm on there. Um, and then uh, Facebook, we, we maintain a very low Facebook presence. We are not big Facebookers. Um, mostly we use it to say when we have a new blog post. So. Uh, we've been surprised at how stable the market was through the economic downturn. Uh, we had always heard that the local food market was more stable in downturns, um, and uh, it's, it's really true. We, we did not have trouble selling anything through the whole downturn. Um, we had very few customers tell us that they had to stop being a customer for financial reasons. Very, very few. Um, and then we are part of the Buy Fresh, Buy Local campaign out of Drake University. It's like a $50 a year fee and you get listed in their directory. And we do have a small but steady stream of customers that find us through that. Uh, point of sale, we do have drop-offs once a month from June through November, um, six months out of the year, year um, in Ames, Des Moines, and Pella. And what we have is our customers pre-order using that pre-order uh, form on our website. And then uh, we bring them exactly what product they requested, um, and then we sell it right there. Um, we do not bring extra. It's not like a farmer's market. It's a set drop-off time. And then um, the Iowa Food Cooperative, that's about 15% of our sales, and that's been a really good source for us. Uh, it can also be a source for some of those things that are maybe a little bit oddball, um, but people want to try something new, and they're willing to try, you know, making stock out of chicken necks or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, even though we only have a pound of them. So um, that's a pretty good source. And then we do one sample Sunday at the Pick a Fence Creamery in Woodward, um, just November, and that's a turkey pickup day. Uh, that is the biggest sales day we have of the entire year. Uh, this year it was about $3,000 in, in one day, four hours. Um, and then last year it was about 5000 and that was because of the turkey weight difference. Uh, we do not do farmer's markets. They're, the logistic issues for meat are beyond what we can cope with right now. We don't have a refrigerated truck, um, and a lot of farmer's markets require them. So, uh, we don't have trouble selling what we raise, and so far we haven't had to explore that market. So we, we don't find it to be an efficient uh, expenditure of our time either to, to have a regular farmer's market. So uh, this, this chart I made is the potential customers is the list of, our, as we keep a customer list of people we email when our order form's ready or when we're coming to town or whatever that is. And then the second column is the ones who actually did order this year, who had a pre-order. We had a total of about 86 different customers, and 64 of them are represented on this list. So the remaining ones are ones that were walk-ups at the Pick a Fence Creamery Sample Sunday, or whatever it is. Um, and so I, what I thought was interesting about this was that you can see that Ames is a very mature market for us, and we're not a it's not a growth market. We came from Ames, we maintained our customers there, but that's not our growth area. Um, <laughs> and then. Um, Des Moines and Pella are our growth, growth areas, and the low percentage on Pella is because a lot of people kind of si are starting to find us. So at the end of this last year, we had some people kind of join our mailing list that haven't had a chance to really order yet. Looking at our uh, competitive position, there are only two uh, poultry lockers left in the state that handle small quantities of poultry for retail sales, and uh, we're of the people who raise poultry on pasture in central Iowa, we have a pretty close proximity compared to them. It's kind of nice, for the longest time, we were the farthest ones away, and so the lockers have kind of shifted, one opened and one closed, and so it's, it's nice that we're, we have a locker close to us. Sorry, it's nice that we actually have a locker close to us, but for the longest time, we didn't. So we, we used to be driving two and a half hours to the locker, now it's an hour 45, so one way. Uh, a lot of other producers in central Iowa raise heritage turkeys. We don't. We don't see the financial logistics of that. I think it's, I think it's kind of crazy. Uh, Heritage turkeys are extremely expensive as chicks, almost $10 a pop. They would take almost twice as long to finish, and I just don't see the, the cash flow on that. For us, turkeys is, is our biggest money maker uh, right now, and so that uh, I just don't even want to dabble in Heritage turkeys. So I don't compete in that arena. For eggs, there's a lot of different sources for eggs. I mean, you can get them. A lot of farms have varied uh, ch chicken flocks. Uh, 
We always have consistent demand for our eggs. We do, uh, we're usually short, but on, occasionally, on, a, on the occasion that we're running high on inventory, we do have an egg handler's license, which lets us take them to the uh, Iowa Food Cooperative. And uh, we have no problem selling them there. I mean, there are women that literally wait for midnight when the cart opens and then just hit those eggs hard because they're gone in almost instantaneously. So I'm looking forward to as we add birds, we take with our new chicken house, we go from 65 hens up to about 120. And so that'll give us the opportunity to really use that license more effectively to use the Iowa Food Cooperative. Uh, with our grass-fed lamb and beef, there's a lot of producers that raise lamb and beef, but there's not as many producers that actually do grass-fed as opposed to grass finishing. So we're we uh, avoid the use of all grains. It does take us a little longer, but it, it, I think it commands a higher premium, and I'm very pleased with the quality of product that we've been able to finish at this point. And it's nice, it's nice too, that we have a stable customer base. Was when the when beef is ready, we just drop an email, and man, that thing is sold in no time. So I'm really pleased about that for beef and moving forward and raising more beef. For moving forward, we, our plan is based on the following primary assumptions. We're assuming that our locker remains open. We've lost one locker in the state this year, so we're down to two, two out of three that, that handle, are handling poultry. Uh, the regulations got a lot tighter for lockers this year, so it's, it makes us a little nervous. So that'll be, if that were to change, that would be significant scrambling in terms of probably doing on-farm processing and letting, so we would increase our margin, but we would be letting some of our retail outlets go. Uh, we're assuming that we maintain our 40-acre land base and that we can maintain the 17 acres that were rented. We're looking at additional land in the future, but that's still quite a ways off, and so I'm a little he hesitant to speculate, given the quality of land in our neighborhood, what that might be able to hold. Uh, I would, we're assuming, also assuming that the Iowa Food Cooperative remains a viable venue for us. Uh, we have seen them try to bring in more customers. We have seen their competition increase there over time. And so, I, I mean, it's still 15% of our business. We're still reasonably pleased with how it's working for us. We're also making the other basic assumptions are pretty self-explanatory that our feed source remains the same and that Janice's income continues. So we did SWOT analysis, um, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, this is always a valuable exercise. I always like doing this. Um, and one of the, the strengths that I think is most important and maybe the hardest to actually train somebody in is the gift of gab, is what I call it. And that's, I mean, that's part of what we're doing right here, the ability to talk to people. Um, that's one-on-one, -on -one, talking to people when they come pick up their product. Um, it, it's really important when you direct market to be able to talk to your customers. It's just, it's crucial. Um, you cannot kind of be the muttery type who doesn't like to talk to people. Or if you, you are, you have to get over it for two hours a month. <laughs> and uh, so I think the ability that we have to do that is, is really important and uh, is something that we're pretty good at. Um, weaknesses, uh, our soil on our farm and our, our topology are both um, not very good. Uh, we, we got our farm inexpensively, and that is um, part of why. Um, for those of you who know what a corn suitability rating, ours is 33. And that's the average for the entire farm. So that's counting the good stuff. Um, so, um, so yeah, so those of you who know what that means, it's really not very good land. Uh, it's very sandy, it's very hilly. Um, but on the other hand, that means it's uh, a lot of it is native prairie because nobody in their right mind would till it. And um, so our diversity of our species is very good. Um, but our quantity and our quality of our forage is, is still lacking. Um, opportunities, infrastructure, we've talked about a little bit, fence, water, buildings. Um, it, that's uh, really kind of important and um, uh, it's someplace we need to grow. Uh, threats, loss of the locker. Ryan's talked about that. That's definitely our biggest threat. Market potential. This is what we feel that our farm could grow right now at 2011 prices with 2011's land base. Um, so we could be processing more beeves. We don't have that big of a uh, herd in order to do so. And uh, that's really our limitation there. Lamb, we could do more but than the 12 you see up here. But... Um, it's a, uh, we don't really want to do that many. Ryan moves the electric net every other day or so in the summer, and it's electric net. So setting up for a big herd is just, it's more work than he can handle. Uh, other than that, the rest of the stuff is pretty accurate. So we have a potential to be grossing about $26,000 a year with what we currently have. Um, cash flow, now Luke has some handouts, I believe, uh, but the cash flow on there is wrong. <laughs> because Janice, the engineer, cannot count or add. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> um, so 
this is pretty typical for the cash flow for our business. As you see, quarter one and quarter two are, are, are tight for us, and quarter three and quarter four are where we make enough money to actually have some money flow. Um, so we, we kind of scrape by um, the first couple quarters, and then we, we make it up in the last couple quarters. So this turkey sales being weak, we probably are going to have to borrow. The business is going to have to borrow from us in order to um, keep cash flow this, this next year because of the loss of sales. And then income and expenses, uh, you know, see full of numbers here. But bottom line, that very top line where it says total sales, um, you see that in 2010 and 2011, uh, you can see that $5,000 we keep talking about. It shows up right there. Um, we should have had another five grand. And if we had had that five grand, we would have broken even. So this was supposed to be our break even year. Uh, when we planned for this year, it was going to be our break even year. And then life happened. <laughs> um, so moving forward, we have a lot less in infrastructure that we have to buy as we get our building built, as we start getting fences up, as we have a water system moving. So the water system was 2010, the building was 2011. As we get fully capitalized, our numbers are going to continue to improve. Looking at our pricing moving forward, uh, we're fairly... We're uh, pretty far on average. I mean, we're pretty close to average for a lot of the poultry producers that raise pasture poultry in central Iowa. Three dollars a pound is pretty common. We're probably a little below it, below the norm now. I think that that's why we're moving up to three thirty. Our prices continue to move, costs continue to move up, and so we have to make that uh, adjustment. It's been, I think, two years since we've made that adjustment in our in our uh, uh, chicken prices. Uh, as for uh, the eggs, our egg prices probably are a little soft for the metro area, but are a little, or high for, for the Pella area, and so we have a lot of regular customers in Pella, so we generally try to thread that needle between what, what's tolerable there and, what's, and what we think we can get in the metro. Uh, for our ground beef, for our beef quarter especially, I think our, we were priced low. It was our first uh, avenue, first meanderings into the beef this year, and so uh, I, th I think we're gonna raise the quarter price so that we feel like it was reasonable return on the amount of work, and I think that, I mean, that, will get us to a much better spot for, for beef. That, that's a hanging. That's, it's packaged weight, actually. Packaged weight. weight. Packaged weight. Yep. Yeah. That's our last slide. That's, that's our last, last slide. slide. So we're good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and our <laughs> lamb price we're pretty comfortable with with the half lamb. So. Yep. And those last about four slides that were C's of numbers, you have that on the handout, other than the cash flow, which obviously I can't add. So, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to mention one thing we forgot is that uh, both of our farms submitted business plans this week ahead of time to our uh, panelists, uh, which will introduce themselves uh, and they'll give some comments, uh, brief comments, five minutes each, mm -hmm. and then we'll take a five minute break, start and then go into Sarah's presentation. No. Hello, I'm Renee Labarge from Lincoln Savings Bank. And uh, first of all, I have got to tell you, the plan, very well thought out, uh, impressed. You had strategy, you had vision, you had a mission. You have core values, I've counted six in your plan. You've also itemized those. Uh, truly, truly a solid plan. From a marketing aspect, that's gonna be my focus on the plan. We're gonna talk a little bit about your web presence. And um, honestly, I love the survey monkey that you had for your initial customer service survey. Phenomenal, that is a great idea. Blog, Facebooking, excellent. Web presence with the web page, Dreamweaver, amazing that you figured that out. And uh, keep capitalizing on that. I think you have a good uh, strategy there. The other thing though that I would recommend is maybe to have another customer service survey. Yeah, yeah. and survey monkey's free. <laughs> so <laughs> utilize that definitely and maybe you can expand. And I really do think that's a good time to ask about the pricing as you thread between the Pella and the Metro markets, um, that will help your bottom line. Good deal. The other thing is to continue to promote uh, by word of mouth and getting out there through direct mailings if you can. Uh, is that optional? Okay. Terrific, because you're touching a different generation in there, and that's a good thing. Yeah, um, you might not have been able to hear, Ryan. We have a presentation actually on February 28th to one of the local churches. They actually approached us. They found us, and they said, oh, big church. Pella is all about big churches, if you've never been to <laughs> yes. Pella. Yes. 
Um, and they want to talk, uh, they want, have got speakers talking about various local foods and how to eat healthy and all that sort of thing, and they invited us. So Perfect. that's the kind of word of mouth that we do. Okay. Great plan. Good morning. I'm John Jaffe, a farm business consultant with Farm Credit East based in uh, Dayville, Connecticut. Um, got a chance to take a look at your plan and again, very, as Renee said, very nicely detailed. Uh, a lot, clearly a lot of effort into it. Um, I like the diversity of meat products that you've got. That way, if one is a tougher year, you've got the ability to shift back and forth. So I thought that was, that was real nice. I also really like the way you laid out uh, your plan, the short-term goals, the mid-term goals, and long-term goals. You really show how are we going to move along there? I thought that was kind of nice. Uh, I also like that you have a diverse market area. Obviously, I don't know uh, Iowa as, as well as I know the Northeast, but it seemed like you were covering three different areas, um, spreading out your market pretty well versus putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, in one particular area. I've done a lot of work with business plans over the years. I was a lender for 20 years, so I reviewed plans for financing. Uh, I was led a financial services program, so I helped prepare the information. And for the last eight years, I've been a business consultant writing plans. So I'm going to, when they focus a little bit more on the marketing, I'm going to focus on the plan itself. Um, number one, in, in taking a look at the plan, one of the biggest things that I see is people get very focused into the numbers, into the details, and sometimes they need to step back and take a look, does the plan make sense? Again, in this case, there were the math errors. You take a look at it and, you know, you take a quick look and it, the numbers just don't work. So um, that's something that can trigger a plan. If everything is beautifully done, everything's laid out, and there's an error in there, it kind of takes away the credibility. So again, something to look for. Other thing, in looking at your business plan, you had the two years that you had some of the production uh, challenges with 59 turkeys out of the 300 and the 300 broilers out of 640. You talked about the challenges, but in the plan you never addressed how are you gonna improve on it going forward. You, know, you talked about the financials, but those issues that were there, you never said, this is the issue, this is how I'm gonna cure it, this is why it's gonna be better in the future. So addressing the changes is important. Uh, and then the third thing, you cover some of the, uh, co the basic costs, but there were a number of uh, costs you did not include, like insurance, uh, repairs, um, interest expense. What I suggest to a lot of people is that they use a Schedule F as kind of a guideline the to take a look at all the different expenses. Actually, th that is, that we did use a Schedule F. Um, those are personal expenses, the way we do them, because it is my off-farm income. So interest expenses, mortgage, and insurance are attached to the house, and so those are my income. So they're not business income, and they're not business finances. So I know that's a little strange, and I know sometimes people use their, try to use their farm as their income, and we're, we're honestly not trying to do that. We're trying not to be a hobby farm, but we know we're starting out. We, we just made the decision that that's not the goal of the farm at this point. So you're, you're right, and that stuff does belong on there, um, but it's not the way we're charging it, I guess. Well, I, I, yeah. guess, I guess what I'd suggest, is as you know, right now it's a small operation, but as it gets bigger, mm -hmm. some of your insurance is going to maybe some liability insurance specifically for the farm. Mm -hmm. So separate, you know, separate out the insurance on the house versus separate out the insurance on the building, mm -hmm. interest expense on the building, on the business versus the house, okay. repairs, et cetera. Okay. Again, it's just showing that separation. Mm -hmm. And the other, only other minor item is that in your expenses for 2010, 2011, you included some of the infrastructure costs of growing the business. If you have those as capital improvements for mm -hmm. what you've done so far, yeah. you know, right now it shows that you have some losses in the two years and then a strong income. Part of those losses is that you're reporting some of the improvements for the operation building the building. If you separate that out and call those capital improvements, because you call the ones in the future capital improvements. I think they're in your appendix that way. I think the appendix profit and loss includes the capital of building that building. I think for going forward. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I didn't include the profit. You're right. I need to include the 2011 profit and loss full. <laughs> okay. But again, <laughs> very well thought out, a lot of detail. Plan makes a lot of sense, and I wish you luck. Uh, I'm David Miller, and I have a company called Working Farms Capital. And what our company does is provide, from, from an invest, investor point of view, we connect investors, long-term investors, with uh, sustainable agriculture and specifically farmland. So we are uh, constantly, uh, farmers are spending their time transitioning their soil and getting the most of the, out of the soil. And what I spend my time is transitioning investors and um, um, getting them to a long-term a long focus. 
um, and, and that's a mess right now. But so there's a lot of work to do there too. <laughs> in any case, um, with the plan here, if you maybe um, Janice, if you want to go back to the goals, sure. Um, since since um, you know if if uh, uh, probably the biggest issue that I see when I review plans is I encourage people to think big and think long term. And, and last night, I think we certainly saw an example for those of you that attended the dinner with um, Fidel Baccio, who started Bon Appetit. Um, I got to believe he was thinking big uh, from the beginning. So why not think big? Um, and, and then, of course, act conservatively. Um, so with regard to the goals, um, what I guess one of the areas that I would like to um, know more about is buying land because that's a huge part of your business since you're focused an awful lot on livestock. So, you know, that's an area where uh, I would say, you know, can you lease land now? C you know, what can you do to secure your future in that area? Yeah, we're looking at it adjacent 44 acres of ground that uh, is currently been rolling old in CRP, but we're, we have a grazing option on it moving forward. So we're looking at hopefully being able to lease that once our cattle herd gets to the point where that would, uh, would, would work if not buy it. So that's, that's, I mean, we're looking at that adjacent piece. We're also looking, we've got a neighboring far farmer that custom grazes uh, about uh, two miles down the road. And so that's a possibility we're talking with him right now. Uh, he has a renter currently. I mean, he basically is, is, has a guy that brings his cattle there and he custom grazes them. And so that guy's looking at getting out of the business and that's something else we're kind of flirting with right now. So we've got a couple options on the burner that we're trying to keep warm. We just don't know which, what's gonna open up first or or what to go after first. We're just kind of, well, we're just, we're just kind of working on them right now and hopefully yeah. we can burst forward when we get in, a, when, when something cracks. So we're just trying to remain ready to pounce. Well, that's, you, you, you know, farm, farm ac farmland access is a huge issue and with the run up of prices and, and yeah, Iowa, this is I'm poor sure ground too. Poor. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> still, you need it to grow. So, you know, whatever you can yeah. do now to secure, secure that. that uh, yeah, we're yeah. working like on some of our ground that we rent. We, it's only 10 acres. We're, we're trying to get a 10-year lease on that, so lock that down. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if this was mentioned already, but um, the, you don't have the cost of the land um, in yeah. in your projection. You no. probably should put that in there okay. just to be fair. Just not, not that allocated toward the house, but just to the farmland itself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's no problem. Anyway, gr uh, great plan. I like the diversity. Um, I like the smoked turkey. I think that's got some legs. <laughs> yeah. uh, not a lot of people so, sell that one, so that's something a little different well, in Central Iowa. It caught, it caught the panel's attention. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but, and the values are great. So, but don't be afraid to run it out, run the plan out five years. You, you know, obviously have goals up here three to five years. And part of this, uh, you know, one of your values and, and goals is for Ryan and, and your family to get, get a, reach a sustainable income. Mm -hmm. So what is that number, you know, get it in there. Okay. And, and put a plan together. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Your general questions? Until, yeah, until 25 after, uh, the room is open for questions from the audience. Um, and then we'll take that short five minute break to transition to Sarah. And we'll do a, a, another another round. So I'll have to order once it start. First hand is here. Uh, hi, I'm considering uh, renting some pasture for uh, for some hens, and I have no idea what is a, a reasonable price for renting pasture. So could you enlighten me a little on what's a fair price? <laughs> What, how does the pasture look, anyway? How good is it? Is it open? Has it been hayed? Is it like full of brush? Uh, brush is bad if you're raising chickens, by the way. Uh, that's just you know, I, I honestly don't nest. know because I, I just kind of started thinking about it. We'll, so we'll assume it's halfway decent then. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably pretty good. Ah. Oh, maybe somewhere around. Forty or fifty dollars an acre, depending on your location. That's about we're doing about full forty. Is about what we're running right now for for good hay ground. Well, I mean our CSR is terrible, but uh, it's it's de it's a decent sod. Yeah, I agree. 
All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, definitely the quality of the, the pasture has a lot to do with it. A lot of also is, does it have fence? Does it have water? Do you care? For, hen for hens, you do not care if it's got fence. They're going to ignore it anyway. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for cattle or whatnot, you, you pay more for fence. We don't have fence on hardly anything we rent. If you're putting chickens in a pasture too, you're probably going to want some way to knock that grass down either by mowing it or they're going to want to, or you might want to rent some access to some ground that somebody's already haying or you're going to want some kind of uh, animal. That's why we got in the sheep in the first place was to knock it down so we could, we could get uh, chicken tractors and things through it. Otherwise it'll just get too tall. I, as I listened to you talk, I was particularly interested also in the, the land aspect. And I don't, I've not seen your place, so I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what land might be available, what it might cost to either to buy or rent. I, so that I was really interested in that aspect. And the second thing is I, I'm assuming that you both are fairly handy at doing things. <laughs> or if you're not, how, how much, how, how, how much, if any, have you had to hire help to help you oh. renovate this place? Well, uh, I'll start with the land. Um, uh, we bought our land for $75,000 for 38 acres and then two acres and a house, and the house was 128000 Comes out to about eighteen fifty an acre. It is dirt cheap for land in Iowa. Um, it is because our land is cruddy, <laughs> um, and we are in the middle of nowhere. What was that? That was in 2008. Yep, we bought that at the end of, we actually closed on it at the end of 07. Um, however, we have recently been appraised and we really haven't moved. Um, the, the rest of the house, yeah, the house hasn't moved, land hasn't moved. I mean, when you're in where we are, <laughs> nothing ever sells, so they don't ever reappraise. So we did not have a bubble, we did not have a burst. <laughs> it's just land. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and yeah, it has not been going up um, with the rest of farmland in Iowa. Um, farmland in Iowa usually, for the equivalent of our land, um, roughly, I would expect to pay about three an acre right now, 3,000. Well, we only have 12 acres of actual crop ground that, that's been, that has cropping history, sporadic cropping history on it. So, uh, and man, I, I've, we've rented it out before and I've seen the crops that come off it and I don't know why you would ever crop that ground. So that, is, that has been a seeded to grass through the REAP program, and so we have a 20-year maintenance agreement on keeping it in grass. Uh, the handy thing, uh, I am a mechanical engineer. That does not mean I can do anything handy. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, computers, yeah. I'm a technically-minded person, so I will go and figure out whatever it is. But I am not handy. I cannot fix your tractor. I can't fix my tractor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as far as hiring help, um, honestly, a lot of it gets undone. We just don't do it. The tractor is a mess. We really need some help. Um, we sometimes barter for help. Uh, we have bartered for help with the tractor before. Um, we, uh, we have a volunteer who comes out to our farm who's moderately handy. He helped us build our building, um, but he's not great. But we barter product for help. Um, we don't have the cash flow to hire better help, um, and volunteers is a lot of how we get things done. Um, other than that, I don't know. Like I said, a lot of stuff just plain guns goes undone. I know that's a bad answer. But well, mechanically, yeah. We, I mean, the, the tractor needs some help. It's on the list. Re the redoing the hydraulics yeah. and such, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, mechanically, those things don't happen on a regular basis. Okay, we'll, we'll go to the next question here. Um, I also, I'm a poultry producer. I raised 400 broilers this last year and I have 120 laying hens. And um, feed is an issue. Um, I have all natural feed right now, but I would like to go non-GMO. Um, Cost-wise, what are you guys presently feeding? I'm working with a local producer and then I am uh, found a source for oats that I'm supplementing. And also uh, butchering possibly is gonna be an issue because um, my friends down at Kimbleton were unsure if they were going to continue, and I've gone there for a long time. They're not going to continue. That's what they last, I, I, my last time I was there was in November, and they just said they weren't going to no, deal that, with that it. That locker's done. Which is sad. I mean, very sad. That's so I wondered if you could also uh, state who you know is open at this point, because I have, I uh, pre-sell everything, and I, I would like to continue. 
If, if you pre-sell everything on farm, you might consider doing it yourself, because you can do 1,000 birds a year and still be under federal regulations, and that'll increase your margin considerably. Right now we're paying $2 a chicken to have them butchered. They get done at a, out of Valley View Poultry in Drakesville. That's a fantastic locker, by the way. This is the newest locker I've ever seen built in the state of Iowa in terms of a small-scale locker. It's run by an Amish family. It's fantastic. It's, and then the other locker would be up in green. I've never been there. It kind of scares me, honestly. It's a long ways away. <coughs> it's a long ways away, too. Okay. Yeah. It is a long ways away. Not because of the locker. We have never been a locker. So I'm going to respond just quickly to the, the second locker that's in green. We currently, we do, we've been doing about 800 pastured poultry uh, a year. We go to green. We've been there for quite a few years. Um, she's a small locker. Um, it's an older shop, but they do a really nice job. The birds are really clean. Um, been very pleased. They're marked well. They're state inspected. Um, and they are continuing again another year. So uh, we've been very happy with them. Good. You know, <clears throat> I had heard some talk that maybe they would eventually retire because they are an older couple. So that would, yeah. It's going to come. So that locker, you know, I mean, it's, it's, got, a, it's got a timer on it, basically. I have a question for uh, David Miller here with uh, Working Farms Capital. Um, you addressed the land issue. You know, basically they need to have more land to make this happen. It's obviously cost prohibitive in Iowa. Do you have investors that you work with that are interested in owning land and working with a business such as this? Uh, that's a huge, huge issue. Um, one of the reasons I'm here is to work on that. Um, we, we started in Illinois, we started our business in Illinois and, and we, our focus initially was on the middle-sized family farmer, you know, not necessarily the, the brand new beginning farmer, because uh, we had to start somewhere and there was a great need in the middle, because the middle farmer is sort of being squeezed out. Uh, they're the sustainable, you know, sized middle farmer. Um, the answer to your question is I'm not sure yet. Um, Iowa, one of the problems in Iowa is the uh, corporation law that you, a corporation cannot own farmland. And that actually does not help the situation if in fact you're trying to group small investors or long-term sustainable investors, et cetera, you know, together to try to, uh, you know, uh, create a solution to this problem. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it have everybody individually own acres is going to be <laughs> very challenging. So, so we're really putting together, trying to put together a plan to address that now. Um, and I, um, or no, I mean legally, legally, economically, I'd say that there's a huge interest out there uh, for investment capital coming into sustainable agriculture and owning farmland. And the key there is that the leases have to be long term. And what, so what we're trying to do, what we want to do is create a generational lease so that you as the farm tenant can feel comfortable that you're going to have that land for a long time. Otherwise, what's the incentive? It just doesn't work from a business point of view. So uh, we've, we've started to do that already uh, by, I, I mentioned, transitioning investment capital to, you know, think long term. So that's happening. Uh, we've been successful. We have an investor group, group of... Um, that uh, is very jazzed about this as an investment. Half of our investors are using their IRA accounts, so it's a good fit. And I'll talk more about this at 11 o'clock, so. Questions from this side of the room, right here? And I'll go to you, too, sir. I, I just want to know whether you're organic or not. We are not certified organic. No, I don't think feel like that uh, premium is something that can be a capsulate that we can really uh, capture in our market. If we exported to like the Chicago area and we did a lot of shipping, then I think you might be able to do that. But uh, with our current location and our current trade area, I don't I don't see that happening. We're very upfront with our customers about what is and is not organic about what we do, um, and uh, what we do not do that's organic is fairly minor, and we always refer customers who want certified organic to certified organic producers that we know. Um, and uh, we have made the decision to feed local feed versus organic feed. It is still chemical free, 
Um, but uh, we expect our customers to want to make that same decision, and so we, were, we are trying to be consistent. And so, um, yeah, that's... I mean, the hardest thing for us would probably be the uh, GMO-free soybean meal and the getting that certified. That probably would be the hardest hurdle. And I just don't see getting a return on that that would, that would justify the expense and effort to get it. Oh, for the lady that was asking about pasture rent, Iowa State University Extension is the best place to go to figure out what a fair rent rate is. And then if you can negotiate below that, more power to you. <laughs> but um, this is great, what you guys are doing. And my wife and I are kind of working on something similar to this. We're not quite as many products. We're trying to focus a little on just a few less products that we can just do better. <laughs> but I'll tell you, for the people sitting in the front of the room, and, and I let, you know, I work with farmers and landowners, my off-farm job, I work for uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service in Northern Iowa. So do I, in Jasper County. Okay, excellent. So you work with Kurt Donahue. Yes, I do. Great. Um, the, there, and people laugh when I tell them this because, you know, the, the media tells you one thing, but, you know, there's a farm crisis going on right now, no different than the 80s. It just looks a little different, but it's happening right now because young people that are sitting in this room can't get in the market and are going to be unable to get into the market. I mean, unless you have, you're born into a lot of land or a lot of machinery or equipment, as we're finding out, it is like, nearly impossible to get in and it's this land thing and it's it's out of control and I hate to say this but I hope I'm I'm hoping for the crash so I got a chance to get in <laughs> and, and it's sad to say but I hope it happens because otherwise you know we're never getting in yeah we were born into 700 acres in our family family in Madison County and we told them what we wanted to do and they told us to take a hike yeah, so literally yep so that's why we bought what we bought that's why we bought 40 acres did Most you have a business plan acreage. Did you show him your business plan? Yeah, I don't think Grandpa would have called. I don't think he would have cared. Is that the room? Question? Is that the room? Even if you're born into it, you may You may not get it, so. <laughs> uh, is your own labor figured into the... No, 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 okay. no, 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 okay. Labor is painful. Why not? <laughs> Do you really want me to show you the like two cents I make an hour or, or the 25 cents I lose an hour? I don't want to. I mean, I can do it. But you know how much it costs. You know how much labor time it costs. Uh, yeah, we do. We, if you sit down and talk to us about what it takes to, to raise a dozen eggs, yeah, we do know what that is. We don't talk about it, and we probably should. Uh, but we, we view these as building years, and we don't expect to be paid for our labor yet. We do expect to be paid for labor in the future. So from the panel, I guess it'd be interesting to know, because this is, you guys are we, we, yesterday we saw another farmer that didn't calculate his uh, labor and labor. expenses for the first couple of years. How important is it uh, for those uh, labor expenses to be expressed through the plan? I guess uh, ultimately it's, it's uh, very important. I think like Dave alluded to, you know, what is your longer range plan? Mm -hmm. Very typical in business plans for the first few years. It's the sweat equity. It's the anticipation that there will not be a return Typically, it's an off-farm job. It's some loans, a uh, way to get through it. But again, the longer term, you want to try to find a way uh, to make it work. One of the things that we uh, focus on business plans is something called bottom-up accounting. And what that says is, how much is your debt service? How much profit do you want to make for your labor? You start with that number. That's your bottom line. And then you work up to what your gross sales are going to be from there. And if you can't meet it, that's when you change focus. So short term, it's not as important. Long term, absolutely critical. And that's kind of what this was, was to, to ourselves to figure out if, if with our potential, could we make yep. what we want to make. Right. Yeah, that's what this, this exercise was for. Land -based. Yeah. Well, let me, let me turn that around. Based on those numbers, does that work for you? Does that yes. generate enough? It, it's, it's tight. <laughs> okay. We'd like to see more. I think with the la uh, land-based expansion, I think that possibility looks a lot better. I mean, beef is pretty generous to us as we grow our own herd. And so I think uh, moving forward that... It'll look a lot better as we're able to finish more animals. Uh, yeah, I'm not actually anticipating leaving my off-farm job. I, I am an engineer. I make a good income. I, that was never the anticipation. So we are not a farm that is trying to make it work on just farm income. I know there are, are those out there. Um, but, I, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's my job and it's my career, and, and I'm okay with that. So... Um, that's just this, our situation, which is why our mortgage is not in our expenses, because that we are not anticipating 
changing that. And I, I guess that's the other point is that as long as the, the, the couple are consistent on their desires, I got farmers that are very happy being there was a 40 cow dairy, they've always been 40, and that's the size they want to be because that mm -hmm. th meets their family lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We also have some that are 800 cow dairies because their opportunity, their, their desire was to get as big as possible. Mm -hmm. So if you're consistent with your what's important to you, mm -hmm. that's absolutely critical too. Any Dave? Any? Five minutes. Of, five minutes left to questions. If you expand your land base, uh, are you looking at adding a, you know, a labor component other than uh, Ryan and volunteer? <laughs> I think it would largely depend on the number of children, honestly. Uh, if, if we have three, I'm looking at about the next 10 years of taking care of small kids before that really opens up. So um, if we have two, that, that window becomes a lot more narrow. So. It kind of depends on the number of children. If there were three, probably would. If two, maybe not. And so it kind of depends on uh, if it's if mostly what we're adding is, is cattle to the business, then the, that scales up fairly favorably for us. If it's if we add a lot of poultry, that um, I'm trying to think of the proper word for it. Uh, I can't think of the mar of the term. But you know, like, a, like every time you add additional another chicken tractor you've got to do all the chicken chores with you add a couple more beef you're still moving the same fence each marginal day. revenue yeah. i can't think of it off the top of my head that's not quite it but <laughs> economies of scale boom yeah cat <laughs> cattle scale up very well and sheep don't in this scenario because of the the net and the need if you're going to raise sheep well you're probably going to have to have woven wire fence and the cost of that doing it over 40 acres is disgusting i don't even want to think about it so uh Woven wire is very expensive, let alone doing 40 acres and fencing out your draws and everything to meet the obligations we have. No, I'm not doing it. So, uh, but with cattle, uh, it can be done with cattle. Our current vision is not to add out outside, out of family labor. It is, it is not within our vision. It is not within our goals. Um, we are more likely to scale down our efforts to meet the labor demands we have than we are to increase our labor demands to meet our scale or to scale down our product offerings, maybe like lamb, we would drop that at some point in the future because it's not particularly profitable. But right now they do a lot of ecological servicing for us in terms of keeping down brush because our land does have quite a bit of brush issues and it uh, helps maintain and keep down weeds and it helps break up parasite loads for our cattle as they graze behind them. Yeah, you mentioned you're using like word of mouth advertising to kind of grow your business. Um, what did you do when you first started off? Like, what was your first customer? How did you get your first product sold without having a farmer's market? We made a customer list with family and friends on there, and we hit them up. Yeah, <laughs> we did. And then it grew from there. Yeah, some of them. That's how we started our first year. Some of them are still good customers, and you are surprised at who knows who. It is amazing who knows who. Um, but yeah, some of our best customers are still actually some really good friends of ours, and um, sometimes that's a little hard to balance, your friendship and your the fact that they're your customer. Um, but uh, most of them really understand that you're trying to make a, a living and trying to make a business. So yeah, friends and family uh, were very, basically where we started. And then Ryan was part of the Sustainable Agriculture Program at Iowa State. So there was a customer base right there in all of his um, classmates. So the Sustainable Ag Program. Um, p make business cards and pass them out. Do not ever find yourself without them. They should have your name, your phone number, and your website on them. And, and you should not ever hesitate to hand somebody one because they are cheap for what they get you. Yeah, and, and I would say that, that some of the maturing of our Ames market is probably as those students have graduated and moved on, those, those people have left our base. And so our more loyal core of people that, that live in town, that have families, those people have, hang, have, have remained customers in, into the, the, this state and, and I probably will moving forward. Is there one more question for this farm in the room? Let's give them a round of applause. Met on a Carolinian heading south from D.C. Says he've got himself had picked out of seeds. She smiled and said, Richmond, when asked where she was bound. 
begin to wish my life away. 